thank you very much, Robert. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Kamal Ahmed, the economics editor of the BBC. Welcome, Satya, to uh, London, flew in today. I'm going to let you into a little secret. Um, as the economics editor of the BBC and formerly business editor of the Sunday Telegraph, I get an awful lot of books written by chief executives. And 98% of them are abysmal. Um, uh, and they talk in management gobbledygook about how great they are and all the successes they've had, usually written at the end of their career, not slap bang in the middle. Luckily, Satya, yours is nothing like that. <laughs> Thank uh, you. It came thumping through my letterbox at home, and I sort of looked at it in a slight degree of trepidation, thinking another one of these books that endlessly bores on about how great the person is. But actually, Satya's book is unusual, can I say in that it not only speaks uh, to the big issues of running global corporations, of being a technology leader in this era of such uncertainty about where the economy, where technology, where government is going uh, with great honesty, but it also talks with great honesty about Microsoft itself, and the mistakes, the things that need to change, um, and why they need to change. But also it touches on the huge issues uh, that we're going to talk about tonight, as well as about Satya himself, as well as about Microsoft, the big issues around artificial intelligence, the growth of quantum uh, computing, the notion of augmented reality and what do they mean for us and the type of society we live in. So Satya, welcome. Um, kick off Hyderabad, where you were born, to only the third chief executive Microsoft has ever had. Just take, take us a little bit through that journey. Well, <laughs> first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me here. Um, you know, growing up um, in India, and as uh, I reflected and wrote even in this book, I don't think I had this idea uh, that uh, one day I was going to make it to Redmond, Washington, and then uh, become CEO of Microsoft. Uh, although I'm definitely a product uh, of American technology, in particular even, micro in fact, British in American technology, because my first computer uh, that I, my father bought for me was a Sinclair Z80. Um, and um, <laughs> well, that's where I learned to program a bit in BASIC, and after that, the IBM PC with uh, DOS and uh, Microsoft BASIC. Uh, it had a huge influence, uh, although even when I was learning to code, let's say, I was more into cricket. Uh, I was born um, to two parents. My father was a, a civil servant uh, with uh, uh, Marxist leanings, um, and my mother was a Sanskrit professor. Um, and so they hardly could agree on anything, um, <laughs> which meant uh, that I could do whatever. And uh, the only thing they agreed was I was wasting my time playing cricket, but I enjoyed it. And uh, if you had asked me even uh, as late as even perhaps my 12th grade uh, and said, what, was your, what is your dream? I would have said, you know, play first class cricket for Hyderabad and, you know, play, you know work for a bank. Um, and that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, and somehow, I think my father got the idea that that's very provincial. <laughs> and uh, he forced the hand and said, you got to go out, get out of this place. Um, and uh, was, was it a place where you could succeed? Because now in India, there may be not as many push factors, given the great technological revolution that that country is and has experienced. Would there be the same push factors now as there were when you were young? That's a great question. I mean, I, in some sense, I have, you know, ever since I was 21, uh, I've been in the United States. Uh, but clearly what's happening, whether uh, it's in uh, India or even um, uh, in other parts of the world, the idea that they can create digital technology in the country itself and the jobs associated with it, uh, I think are absolutely happening. I think the circumstances of what was possible uh, when I was growing up versus what is now India's reality is uh, two very different things. Uh, but to sort of finish up, um, I think the thing that at least I picked up uh, in the school I went to and uh, the milieu I grew up in was some strange combination of having intellectual ambition um, and the ability to take the moment, uh, the opportunity you're given, 
uh, and make the most of it. Uh, and those are the two things then, when I look back, uh, perhaps shaped who I was, who I am, and what happened. You talk in the book about um, a number of people who were colleagues who also came from India, this sort of Indian diaspora who went to um, the United States in particular and have been tremendously uh, successful. What do you put that down to, that, that sort of that, that, that march of people into um, America and the success you, you had there? I mean, I think, you know, the, uh, I've not deeply studied uh, uh, the diaspora and especially into the United States, but there seem to be, at least from what I can understand, two different phases. There was a phase uh, early on uh, when uh, the American immigration policy uh, allowed for skilled immigration. Mm. Uh, which led to, I think, a lot of uh, doctors in particular uh, uh, showing up. And then I think I definitely was a beneficiary of the same immigration policy, uh, but being applied uh, to the growth in digital technology, uh, especially in the early 90s, I think, is when uh, a lot of us uh, were able to come uh, participate and contribute. Um, and that's def I mean, that's why I, I, I think... I'm such a product of um, the United States. Uh, I, I always attribute it to these two amazingly unique things, American. One is it's technology reaching everywhere and allowing kids like me anywhere to dream the dream. And then the enlightened American immigration policy that even gave me the chance to live the dream. Um, and so I think that that's a pretty unique American competitive advantage. Your Sinclair didn't encourage you to come to London and meet Clive Sinclair, maybe buy one of his trikes. You know, I, I, maybe if the opportunity had come, but uh, somehow I'd never been to the west of Bombay and I decided to show up in Milwaukee. <laughs> so you joined Microsoft in, in 1992, um, raised through um, the business um, uh, relatively rapidly, but you're sort of um, a dyed-in-the-wool Microsoft person. You write at the beginning of the book that when you took over at Microsoft um, three and a half years ago, that this was a company where innovation had been replaced by bureaucracy, where teamwork had been replaced by um, internal politics. But you were the consummate insider. So what I was wondering as I was reading it, weren't you to blame slightly for those facts? That's a, that's a great observation because... <laughs> <laughs> in, in Might some, be rude, I don't know, but it's, it's no, an observation. I, mean, I, I, I think it's, a, it's, fa it's absolutely right, because I, w I grew up in Microsoft. I've spent uh, 25 years of my life there. Um, and everything that is good and everything that is wrong, I was part of it. Um, and if anything, what I tried to do was not to go look back and say, uh, let us change, uh, but it was to rediscover. After all, here we are, 43 years after being founded. Uh, you know, competing with a whole set of new players, um, and uh, it wouldn't have happened if we would have not gotten a lot of things right. Uh, but it's also important to acknowledge what didn't we get right. Uh, amplify the things uh, that uh, really help us be at our best, uh, and then get rid of the things uh, that are obstacles. Uh, so that was the spirit with which at least I started. In fact, even Steve Ballmer's best advice was, hey, don't try to fill my shoes or don't be victim to my own dogma. Be your own person. Uh, and somehow, you know, as part of, even though I grew up at Microsoft, in all of the jobs I had, um, and I seeked out that outside-in perspective, as best as a consummate insider can, right? You know, you can't be completely objective about it. And there was enough of a debate even, you know, who should be CEO of Microsoft? Should an insider ever be picked given uh, what was at least being written about us? Uh, but in my case, I, I had a pretty first-class view of what it is that we sh who we are, what we should do, what should we make sure we get rid of as even cultural uh, traits or what have you uh, that were obstacles. Uh, and I think in retrospect, that is what was helpful. To your point, an insider and there, who has some credibility, uh, perhaps being critical of the past, knowing that I'm not criticizing myself, is what makes it even possible to change. So you have the trust of the people because you've been there and you know maybe why some of these things have grown up. And also that ability to say, I made the mistake. So instead of I coming down and saying, oh, let me tell you mm. the mistakes you all made, uh, 
let us all. So it is more me as part of the team versus being someone from the outside the team. You talk in, in some detail, you go back to, um, on a number of occasions, some of the, as you say, the mistakes that Microsoft um, uh, made or some of the things which became problematic. And I was particularly interested in uh, Minecraft and Mojang and also in Nokia. Um, what is it about um, an organization where it seems difficult to seize the opportunity that with hindsight seems sort of blindingly obvious. And Minecraft, given that you did eventually buy it, you could have bought it a lot earlier, a lot cheaper uh, than when you did actually do the deal. Why is it when a company can't see what an opportunity is and grab it? You know, one of the things at least I observe, which I write about as the pattern at least, um, that I think all systems have, and in particular in business, this is super important to recognize, is this amazing virtuous cycle that one gets into when one has the first success. After all, when you're a startup, you have nothing, but then you scale up, you have your hit. Around that concept or that hit, you build all the capability, and then around that capability, the culture also develops. So you have this amazing lock between your concept, your capability, and your culture. And they reinforce each other. And it keeps growing. Except there is no such thing as a perpetual motion machine. At some point, whatever you started uh, growing or whatever was the hit stops being one. And now the time's come for you to come up with the next hit. In order to do that, you need new capability. Whatever capability you may have had uh, in the past may not be enough. Sometimes line extensions are easy, but you, line extensions are not all growth. Culture will then fight that. So that is what I think we need to recognize. And was that the PC? Was that where the lock came? Democratizing the PC was, was Bill Gates' great statement to the world. And did that become the lock for your business? But if you look at it, um, one of the things that we were able to do at Microsoft, uh, and it's in fact even true today um, about our business, is we are much more diversified. In some sense, uh, you, know, you can say we caught three or four big ones and we missed a few big ones. So think about it, the PC obviously, but you know, even, let's even say Office was the first big hit. In fact, the Microsoft Office and most Word, Excel were all built for the Macintosh before even Windows was a success. Uh, then we had Windows in Office. Then when I joined, for example, in 1992, no one thought we will ever have a server business. After all, what does a PC company have anything to do with servers? That was the conventional wisdom. Uh, and then we went after it, and uh, we obviously became big in servers, and now we have a cloud business. In parallel, we even built a gaming business with Xbox. So we have done multiple things. But did we miss the web? Uh, big one. Uh, did we miss search? <laughs> even I've heard of that. <laughs> uh, you know, did we miss search? Yeah. Uh, those are all big misses, and mobile is another one. So, but at that same time, uh, I think that's the perspective one needs to have. As I always say, uh, you know, you can aspire to be Don Bradman, uh, but having an above 50 average is not a bad idea uh, for a good test career. So I think that companies uh, really do need uh, to think about, hey, don't rue the misses, uh, but be more cognizant of what and really enable Microsoft to have Four major hits. How many businesses have these 10 billion plus franchises? Okay, tell us, tell us, Sasha, what are what are the keys to, to the big hits? We'll get we'll get back to the misses in a second, but let's let's hear about the hits first. And it's it's you that you talk about a growth mindset is, is part one of your things in your book. It's um, a great point, which yeah. is in some sense one of the things that I said, well, what's the meme we can have where this culture that we have today doesn't uh, inhibit us? to go after a new concept or building of new capability. And that is where, I mean, I, my wife had actually introduced me uh, to this book by Carol Dweck called Mindset, you know, mm. you know, a few years before I'd become CEO. And I was reading it more in the context of uh, my daughters. And uh, that book talks about this very simple metaphor that it's better to be a learn-it-all versus a know-it-all. And uh, I think large successful companies uh, tend to culturally become know-it-alls because after all you're successful, you must mm -hmm. know something. 
um, except if you don't have that learn it all posture, you're not going to be open. So that's where the concept of growth mindset comes from. And we've adopted it uh, internally, at least, as a meme. Because the last thing when I want, uh, what, uh, last thing I want to do about culture was to say, you know, here are the cultural attributes A, B, C, let's replace them with X, Y, Z, because that's not enduring. If anything, you know, people will forget uh, X, Y, Z as fast as they never thought about A, B, C. So to me, it, it needed to be something that had even breathing space, so everyone more confronted their fixed mindset. Sometimes at Microsoft, you know, people will come to me and say, Satya, we found the five people. Uh, who don't have a growth mindset. <laughs> and uh, I, I always say, well, that's, I mean, obviously that's not the point. The point is for you to confront, starting with me, my fixed mindset. And God knows I make a lot of mistakes every day. And am I willing to admit? Am I willing to be vulnerable enough? And that, I think, is the core uh, culture that is needed uh, for innovation. And uh, to me, there is, it's not a formula. Uh, that's why I think it's more of a mindset. I could imagine working for Bill Gates or Steve Ballmer, sort of vulnerability might not be something you really want to show in a, in a sort of office meeting as Steve Ballmer's wanting to know why you haven't hit your targets that month. I mean, it's quite hard, isn't it, for people to, to really feel that they can say, oh, do you know what, Satya, I've slightly screwed up here. Actually, I mean, one of the things I've learned, look, Bill and Steve are uh, guys who have perhaps the most intellectual honesty in anybody I have met. Uh, they, the thing that they're always pushing on is to make sure that you're not feeding them uh, BS. <laughs> um, and so in some sense, I felt that the easiest thing to do with them is to just be very factual, knowing that their standards are so high that even the highest of achievements is not going to measure up. You <laughs> You spoke about, um, you speak a lot in the book about culture and you talk about empathy. And this is a world where there's a lot of cynicism about business. Um, you're talking about empathy, not just internally, but particularly externally and particularly with your customers in the main you talk about. But I was quite interested in that idea of empathy, an empathetic um, approach, given that the, lots of people are suspicious that businesses aren't empathetic at all. They're just about their investors and the bottom line and making as much profit as possible. Tell us a bit about this approach and, and why you use this word empathy so regularly. You know, to me, one of the things um, I look back and say, when did we create our best products and these hits? Beyond having a culture which was, let's say, more the learn-it-all culture, I think the thing that we also had was a deep sense for what are the unmet, unarticulated needs of customers. Because if you said, okay, I'm gonna to talk to five people and sort of do what they tell me to do, that's definitely not going to really get you to a hit product. Uh, you have to have a deeper intuition. Where does that come from? Uh, I believe the best source of it is empathy. Uh, when you are observing the world, or when you're talking to customers, when you're seeing things happen, if you are truly listening, not just to the words, but sort of what's behind them, that's the inspiration for innovation. Um, and so it's an existential business need. Then the question is, how does one develop it? I can't go to work and say, oh, I'm going to be empathetic. Um, because that's just, you know, it's... it's it's impossible to just switch it on if you don't have essentially the learning from your own life's experience. That's one of the things I, I sort of even perhaps more so thought through in this book. Why do I talk like this? Or why did, where did this come from, at least in my case? And then I realized that it all came from these hard lessons, whether it was that first interview question uh, or the last interview question that I got in my Microsoft, you know, after eight hours of uh, uh, you know, solving these math puzzles and computer science algorithms, uh, my, the interviewer asked me, what will you do if you see a baby who's fallen on the street? Um, and I thought, oh my God, this is an algorithm I didn't learn. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there must be some puzzle here I've got to solve. And I searched for a couple of minutes, and then I said, uh, I'll call 911. Uh, the interviewer just gets up 
and he walks out and shows me, uh, you know, sends me on my way, and he says, you know, when a baby falls, you pick them up and hug them. And um, that, you know, I thought so much. I thought I'd blow it and I'll never get the job, but, you know, eventually I did. Um, but that's the kind of experience, or whether it's the birth of my son, uh, which was another very big turning point for us. Uh, those are the moments that, in some sense, grounded me. But having had those personal experiences, I think they informed who I was as a leader, a manager, as a, uh, an engineer. Uh, and that's the connection, at least, I see. I want to pick up on the engineer point in a minute, but I, I do want to ask you about, you, you talk very movingly about Zayn, mm -hmm. um, your wife, Anu, and yeah. um, Zayn, your son, who has special needs, um, uh, was born very prematurely. Um, how, what did you take from that, which, which allowed you to, as you say, you can't switch empathy on, but what was it about that experience um, that changed maybe the way you viewed not just your personal life, but also your work life? Yeah, I mean, for uh, Anu and me, um, he was our first uh, child. Uh, both of us were only children of our parents, and if you even had asked me an hour before he was born, uh, what was top of mind for me? Uh, it was all about, hey, is the nursery going to be ready? Is Anu going to get back to a job as an architect? Uh, what will our weekends be like? And all Bit of, of that. an engineer, maybe, still. That's right. <laughs> um, and I was then... Uh, obviously, everything changed. Um, he was born uh, with severe uh, brain damage, which led to cerebral palsy. And then I watched uh, Anu pick up, you know, in fact, right after she came out, she had a C-section. As soon as she could recover as quickly as possible, she was driving him to therapy after therapy and everything that came so naturally to her as to what she needed to do to give Zane the best chance didn't come to me. I was more thinking about what happened to me? What happened to my plans? Why did this happen? And I must say, it took me maybe even two years or more uh, to truly internalize that nothing actually happened to me. Uh, something happened to Zane, and I had to step up and see the world through his eyes and do my job as his father. Um, and I now understand that. I don't think the process was that linear. Uh, it was tumultuous. Uh, but it definitely shaped who I am. Uh, it perhaps gave me a better sense of being able to see things through others' eyes, whether it's people who work with you as colleagues or people whom you're leading uh, or even customers. Um, and in a very subtle way, uh, I think it defined, uh, it was perhaps the hit refresh moment in my life. Do you think that there is a broader issue? Clearly, you went through an incredibly, incredible emotional journey. Um, I've been fortunate enough to interview lots of um, heads of technology companies, those big global companies of which you now run one. Um, is the problem sometimes with trying to connect with the human world out there that it is run by engineers who maybe lack that journey that you've been through, which has maybe opened yourself up to a different approach? that you can sometimes have an issue that you are run by engineers who find it hard to connect with the concerns of the outside world. And we're going to start going on to those in a little while about AI and such like. I mean, I hope uh, not. Um, but I do believe, to your core of your question, that in a world, we'll talk more, I'm sure, about this, in a world where there is, let's say, abundance of artificial intelligence, what's going to be scarce is real intelligence or human intelligence uh, and human qualities uh, like empathy uh, that all of us need. Uh, it's not going to be like I can do a Fourier transform very fast is probably going to be a commodity. Uh, what may not be a commodity uh, is uh, the ability to relate to people um, and whether you're an engineer, I think great innovation, quite frankly, as an engineer comes because of your real empathy you have for the problems you want to solve for people, after all. Uh, but I would subscribe to that point of view that let us, even in how we talk about the need for new skills, don't do it in such a way that it's so narrow that we lose, I think, what makes us unique as humans and our ability in particular uh, to relate to each other. What did you find was the biggest challenge starting at Microsoft as chief executive in a company that you had not been chief executive for such a long time? I just wondered what the, mo the main challenge was for you. 
You know, one of the things um, which is very different and not realized this um, is, and in fact, Steve had sort of even referenced this, and this is Obama had referenced this, and I never really got it before uh, he left. As a CEO, you can be a CEO of a small company or a large company. The one thing that the CEO does see is very unique because structurally you see everything left to right, what's happening in your organization. Uh, no one who works on your team sees it that way you see it because they all have, by definition, their job to do, which uh, is, there's a structure around it. And the people you work for, in our case, our board, also don't see it. So there is always this asymmetry uh, but in some sense, you've got to get your judgment right uh, based on what you see. So that's one, I would say, there's nothing that prepares you for it. Um, of seeing the whole picture suddenly. Yeah, yeah. and being yeah. the one who has to pass judgment, knowing that people who are going to judge you, whether it's your people who work for you or the, your board, are not seeing the same thing. Uh, it's sort of a pretty unique uh, you know, information asymmetry challenge. Um, and then the second thing, um, is the multi-constituent nature, right? If you had asked me even before I became CEO, I would have rattled off the classic, there's customers, there's shareholders, there's employees, and so on. But it turns out, of course you have all of those constituents, but you have governments and you have uh, other non-profit organizations. All of them together, simultaneously, and you've got to harmonize these, those interests. Because you've got your meetings with the President of the United States to get to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, governments all over. We are a multinational company operating in 190 countries. In every country, whether it's in the US or in the UK, it's about, you know, their country first. Uh, unless and until we can show up and talk credibly on how we are participating in creating local opportunity, whether it's their small business productivity or their public sector efficiency or their own multinationals becoming competitive because of what you do, um, you know, it's, for them, it doesn't matter who you are or what you do unless and until you are really delivering on things that matter to them. What did you learn from the fact, as you write about in the book, that Microsoft was left standing on the cloud by Amazon? What did you learn from that? I mean, it's one of those things I write quite a bit in the book about. It's a classic case, perhaps, of what even um, you know, people will say uh, is the challenge of that lock between uh, your capability, concept, and culture. We had a very successful data center business. In fact, it was growing even as late as, uh, in fact, it still continues to grow double digit. Uh, so why would you uh, say, oh, you know what, we have a good idea which is let's get into a very low margin business as the next big idea. Um, usually that's not considered good <laughs> business decision making. Um, but yet, you sometimes have to make that when you know that the margin structure that you may have fallen in love with is not long term sustainable. Secular changes are going to get to a place where it's better to increase the total pie because what the cloud does is it's market expansive we, although had a big business, we participated in a very small part of what was the IT spent. We had high margins, and we continue to have good margins there, but we needed to see through a different lens, and Amazon, I think, got onto it because they didn't have legacy. It was new for them. Uh, but you know, the good news of that story is uh, we caught it. Uh, we caught our own mistakes. In fact, Steve was the one who saw it, and he got me into this role. He asked me to go aggressively, gave me the support, uh, and now it's a, the fastest growing business, and uh, quite frankly, we're doing super well in the cloud. Let's talk about some of those bigger, not just to Microsoft, but those bigger challenges that the technology world um, is facing um, at the moment. Uh, let's start with artificial intelligence and where that might be going. And what, I, what I've described in the past is sort of role of voice. Who, who controls the pathway that we take? You write in the book that there's sort of a, a distinction between dystopian view of where we're going to go and a utopian view. And actually, we're going to be somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. How is it that the public can trust that technology firms like yourselves like Google, like Facebook, like Amazon, are going to give the public 
what they need and are not going to give the public simply what makes you money. I, I mean, one of the things I think a lot about is with any new technology, we as a society have to be clear-eyed on both sides of it, which is the opportunities for this new technology to have profound impact in our daily life and do good, and at the same time be very mindful of unintended consequences. And in fact, you know, you say when the telegraph first came about, there was wire fraud. Uh, so in other words, we've seen this before, where even though technology brings a lot of good, you also have to be ready to deal, in fact, using technology, the unintended consequences. And I think that's going to be true even in the case of AI. Where at least I am focused on is all of the practical things that one can do as creators of AI. For example, I believe it's actually a design choice. Um, before we even get into the long-term morality, because I do believe a lot in path dependence, right? The fact that where you get started and how you get started has real consequences um, you know, on where you end up. What if we said, we're gonna create AI that empowers humans? as a core conscious design decision. I'll give you an example of it. And at Microsoft, one of the things uh, that is really uh, great to see, in fact, inspired by uh, even uh, some of the projects we've done in the UK and some of the researchers in the UK and our engineers here, we built an app um, called Seeing AI, which is available actually on the Apple App Store, it uses our cloud uh, computer vision technology to give anyone with visual impairment um, the ability to see. Uh, and another uh, colleague of mine, Angela Mills, um, whom I recently ran into, was recounting this. Uh, she has some visual impairment as to what it's done for her, where she now can walk into our cafeterias, order food with confidence because this app allows us to see. Uh, she can walk into conference rooms knowing that that's the right conference room without barging into something that uh, she's not been invited to. And to make, in, in a sense, participating. Um, in yeah. Microsoft fully. So I believe we've got to grab onto those opportunities. Um, now, having said that, we do have to think through, will we ever get to a stage in AI development where we have some of these runaway optimizations, uh, which are all focused on essentially some optimization formula that doesn't care about humans, and that's where these uh, you know, Asimov wrote about how to, you know, solve for the control problem. We do need the moral equivalent of that. Uh, and I think we have dealt with these, even in tech. Uh, how do we fight spam? Or how do we fight botnets? Uh, how does the industry come together to set standards for what are, how is... But who sets those standards? This, this is the key point, I think. It's, it's, it's who sets those standards and how do you ensure that the public and governments are involved in that debate. I know that a lot of technology companies are thinking very deeply about this. But, and I've asked this question of Mark Zuckerberg and I've asked this question of Sundar Pichai, you can't be the only ones in this debate because then you are setting the parameters that some people may have the suspicion are set for the good of you, not for the good of society. Whatever you talk about how great you are and how good you're gonna be for human beings. What's your um, duty to involve the rest of the public square in this debate. No, for sure. So the way I look at it is, first, what we need to do, which we have done, as I said, in lots of other areas, even in tech, around setting standards. Um, you know, you do this in gaming. Um, what, what, in fact, there's a partnership of AI where all of us participate, and one of the state-of-the-art issues that we have with AI, especially with these deep neural nets, is how do they make decisions, right? One of the um, design principles I write about, beyond empowerment being one, is we need to take accountability for the AI we create. Uh, we can't abdicate saying, look, this is a self-learning algorithm, we don't know what it's doing. Uh, that's just not possible. I think the, pub, you know, the society is not gonna accept that. So that means we need to make AI that's more intelligible uh, so that then we can inspect it uh, and then understand it. Uh, that I think is a still a, a, an unsolved problem, but there are uh, people pushing on the research of it. Let us share that, first of all, in public domain. 
Uh, essentially Quite hard for Microsoft. That's not been Microsoft's culture in the past. That open source approach, the notion of sharing, being very collegiate. Your approach has been in the past aggressive. It, it, you're trying again, to find. You're trying to find those those killer applications. Scale beats the opposition, doesn't well, it? Well, look, it's competing hard, and yet doing things that are in the larger interests of the industry we participate in and recognizing that ultimately if all we do is seek rents in the short term, mm -hmm. you're not going to have any profit in the long run, right? That's, I think, uh, that's what if capitalism does teach that. Um, and so I'm much more, like in fact, these lessons of partnership even um, are things I learned at Microsoft. I joined, my first job in the company was to say, let's recruit third party developers so that they can use our server software. So. Uh, in fact, most people don't recognize this, but we are probably one of the biggest committers or open source committers to Hadoop and to Linux. Uh, .NET and everything else that we do is now open source. So I feel that bridge has been crossed. There are some old tapes, and I'm, I'm sure those will... Uh, <laughs> You've almost been through the antitrust battles, you think. You're like the grown-up in the room, aren't you, maybe? <laughs> for the Googles and the Apples and the Facebooks. You've been around for years. You've been through the battles with the governments. What lessons can we learn from that? The, the, the place where we were going is, I think, what all of us have the responsibility to do, which is if you say, look, there's such a thing called good AI, let us make sure that we as an industry that is creating these AI are setting the standards <coughs> uh, for what that is. Uh, ultimately, you're right even, uh, it is going to be of, uh, of interest uh, to governments all over. Uh, as to what, because to the public and to the public, and I think the involvement, that debate, and I'm all for it because the more we can have uh, more scrutiny of how this is being created, uh, I'm not talking about regulation because most people talk about regulation. It's hard for something like we, look, we are not even yet there to have a framework of law to think through how does one you know really arbitrate between national security and privacy. Right? That's not even being discussed in the ways it needs to be discussed. So before we get to AI, let's solve even more pressing challenges around cyber. Uh, one of the things that we call for, for example, is a digital, uh, you know, a digital uh, Geneva Convention. Uh, when nation states are involved, um, it's fairly ridiculous uh, for civilian infrastructure and civilian data to be impacted anywhere in the world. Uh, and so therefore, let us in fact have that and let us get to a place where we do our best legislative work, best diplomacy, best whatever, uh, to get to an equilibrium in our digital world. And that maybe in fact will set precedent for how we can even think about AI. Just before I come to the audience, a couple of final questions. Let's talk about inequality. That's one of the big issues that technology is facing. And I don't mean particularly how Technology companies can increase productivity, can um, maybe tackle some of the economic growth problems we have in um, the country, because I feel I would know what your answer to that is. What I'm actually more interested in is the, the complaint that actually technology companies themselves have created huge inequalities by the fact you work in such profitable ways and that money that you have made has been reinvested in the company itself and to your investors. It, it must make you uncomfortable that Silicon Valley workers going to work on their buses are being egged by local residents who say, you jacked up all the house prices and I can't live here anymore. I mean, that must be a challenge for you. It's almost, it's almost a challenge of your approach to show that you are creating value for people because at the moment they may be looking at you and thinking, well, you're just creating value for yourselves. Look, here's at least where I think it's important um, to distinguish even all of us as separate entities and with different business models. In our case, it's existential uh, for us for there to be success outside of our balance sheet and income statement. It's simple because there is no such thing. We're not some middleman in some two-sided market. Uh, our entire thing is very straightforward. If there is value in what we create, you pay us. You will only pay us if you yourself are making money, whether it's a student, whether it's a public sector organization, whether it's a large multinational. Our entire business model is empowering people and organizations uh, and their ability to create more technology. In fact, if anything, 
That's what gives me the greatest confidence in our business model, being able to create more surplus outside of us, because it's in our interest. It's not, I'm not saying this, that we're doing this out of altruism, but our business model itself is virtuous in the sense, and take the UK, for example. In fact, I was just studying this. Uh, the we started in a, an apprenticeship program in collaboration with the partner channel. Uh, and something like 10,000 apprenticeships were created even in the last couple of years, and we plan to grow that to 30,000. And I was thinking, wow, how is that happening? It's happening because these partners are growing their own businesses in technology around our platform, serving customers who are using digital technology to make their own surplus and creating employment. I believe that's what creates long-term business. Um, and these inequities in societies, I think, are a challenge. Uh, because if all that happens is one sector of the economy is doing super well, and then the rest of the economy, there is no wage growth or there is no job growth, uh, I think is not a stable uh, equilibrium. For you to work in, no. I mean, you have all know Harari, has been on this stage, I've interviewed him, wrote Homodeus about the future of technology. One big point he makes in that book is the digital divide, this notion that those people who can afford the digital ac um, accoutrements that increase their intelligence, their reach, their ability to use AI in the most powerful way possible will become almost these superhuman beings mm. and will leave uh, almost a sort of lumpen proletariat mm. behind who simply cannot afford to engage. And there's a similar argument made by Nal Ferguson in his new book, um, The Square, The Tower and the Square, which is that the networked people at the top will create value for themselves and will go on and will leave this group behind. I mean, how, how is you, as the head of one of the biggest global businesses here, tackle and think about that? That's a, it, it's, a, it's a great issue of our times, I think. I actually come at it the other way around. Um, I look at it and say, how do we democratize these networks? Uh, how do we uh, democratize these digital platforms so that, in fact, they're creating more inclusion? Um, I mean, I'd give you a great example, you know, you, you know in the country I was born in. Um, when I go back uh, to India now and I see uh, some of the startups um, and their need for capital to go after whatever it is that they're going after has now come down by a huge amount because they can just use our cloud. In fact, one of the most fascinating things is we all talk about AI. In fact, I, I look at it and say, the rate at which AI is being commoditized is faster than any other technology I've seen. In fact, most of the AI research, take computer vision, com anything, is all being done in the public domain. Uh, they're all in research papers that are everywhere. Um, and, there, and people like us have now just made that available as commodity services in the cloud for others to use. So to some degree, I feel uh, that we can, in, in some sense, create more of an equal playing field. Even on the network side, LinkedIn, to me, What's our goal with LinkedIn? Our goal with LinkedIn at the highest of levels is to take whatever, the 3.3 billion people in the workforce and digitize those jobs, the skills, the training, so that it's available as a blueprint, as it evolves, not as a static thing, but as it evolves for people to know what jobs to aspire to, what skills to acquire, and where to get that learning. Uh, because I think that's going to be very, very key for economic growth, and especially getting your own economic return. Uh, in, in, in the city of London, and I was, again, pretty pleased to see that, uh, I believe the taxpayers of the city said, you know, we're going to put aside seven, billion, uh, seven million pounds and do a digital skills initiative. And it was great to see that they took actually the LinkedIn data around the jobs, the skills, and said, let's use this taxpayer dollar in a smart way to get people to get skilled in the jobs of the future. Those are some of the mechanisms where networks, platforms, and commoditization or democratization can bring about more broad spread economic growth as opposed to a very narrow um, return. Now, I couldn't, just, I couldn't go to the order just before I ask you a final question. Can you just explain um, Donald Trump to us?
You know, I've met uh, the President of the United States twice, uh, once uh, before he uh, was inaugurated and once after, along with a lot of my industry colleagues. Um, you know, a, a discussion on immigration. Uh, I uh, went through essentially what I talked about. You know, I'm a product um, uh, and a recipient of uh, benefits of uh, the American immigration system, why, why I believe it's uh, to our competitive advantage to make sure uh, that we are smart about how we do that and also show humanity because one of the other things with uh, DACA in particular in the U.S., I feel that uh, the American uh, ethos is captured in not only making sure that the best and the brightest come to the country and skilled immigration, but it's also the being the beacon of hope for those who need it the most. Um, and I think we should preserve it. And we are clear, I'm clear, and the president uh, obviously listened to that. Um, and the other piece I would also say is we talked about investment in digital technology and infrastructure, which is much needed. It's no different, quite frankly, than the conversation we had with the previous administrations or with any heads of state, whether here or in Germany. Um, and so that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Very delicately handled. Let's ask some questions. There's a man right at the back who's urgently put his hand up there. We'll have, um, that's a number two there. There's a gentleman there. We'll have number two first. And then there's a very fast man up there, number four. Yeah, number right four, you. great, in the white shirt. Hello. Hi, thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. My question is regarding artificial intelligence, and you've mentioned how fast it's being commoditized. And uh, my question is, um, how, how do you think, how scared we should be as humans of artificial intelligence replacing our everyday jobs, especially considering the fact that a lot of humans derive their self-identity from, from the jobs that we do every day. Thank you. It's a great Thanks. set of questions. Um, so here's uh, how I would think about this. One is, clearly, as there's more automation because of AI, there's going to be very hard displacement. Now, I think what do we need to do uh, in order to prepare for that is first, actually, let's act grab on to every job opportunity there is where we can race with the machine. There's a lot being written about that. Uh, sometimes we sort of go all the way to full automation where the job is gone, except it's not. Like, in fact, I'll give you another example um, of our interesting collaboration uh, in radiology between uh, Cambridge and uh, University of Washington. Uh, and Microsoft, uh, where uh, they're using uh, artificial intelligence to go through all of the images in pre preparation for radiotherapy. Uh, because one of the more tedious process uh, while you're preparing is to go through and make sure that you're not going to get, you're just going to get the tumor, but not the other uh, rest of the organs. And that process sometimes can be error prone um, and also takes a lot. So let's empower the radiologists with the latest assistive AI technology so that they can, one, get their job done faster and spend more time with the patient. Uh, sometimes we go all the way, let's say, oh, the radiologists are going to be uh, displaced, and it's not going to happen in that sequence. Having said that, let's say, let's take it to the next step. If there is full automation in any job, let us not fall victim to this thinking that there is a lump of labor. Uh, you know, people, the economists call it the lump of labor fallacy. And you know, the question is, are all the jobs that are going to be there in the future that have already been created? Obviously not. Um, and that's where something like this LinkedIn economic graph can even act as a real-time feedback signal. So instead of trying to speculate about what the future is, let us again shape our skills and our economy with the real-time signal. For example, I'm a big believer that people-on-people -people jobs are going to be huge in our economies. They need to be supported through policy with wages. Uh, and so as things, let's say the capital is, being, you know, is getting a huge return because of automation, but labor is required somewhere else, we will need to come up with mechanisms of the return on capital and return on labor uh, with the right equation. So I think there are many things we can do in terms of how to, in a clear-eyed sense, look at AI, its progress, the market signal, and policy so that we can be prepared versus 
thinking it's going to be dystopian as a binary state transition. Um, number four at the back. Um, thank you very much for an absolutely fascinating talk. Could I please get um, linked to the first question, your comment on online education? I think particularly over the next considerable number of decades, the new jobs that are coming into existence are going to demand a very specific skill set. And the old model where you would go to university, get a Bachelor of Arts in any subject, that's completely obsolete. It's obsolete now. You know, the um, tuition fees are far too high. The actual, um, what you actually learn is not demanded anymore. Do you see online education, things like um, Harvard X online, where you could do learn Excel, you can learn accounting, you put on a resume, and then you could provide to an employer for a fraction of the cost? And do you see online education affecting secondary and primary education as well, not just in tertiary level? I mean, in, in all honesty, I'm not the deepest of experts um, to speculate on that trajectory. Um, I observe it, I observe it in primarily through what we are trying to get done in LinkedIn, uh, because we're trying to address that very challenge, which is the requirement of skills or the mapping of skills to jobs is very dynamic and it's changing. And therefore, it's super important for us to really have learning that relates to those skills required for the jobs. That's what we describe as the economic graph. Um, and so that's why we're pouring a lot into the learning aspect. Uh, LinkedIn got started, uh, obviously, more by trying to just map the jobs and the skills. But we recognize that learning is, I think, going to be super important, um, uh, for as, especially people aspire for returns on their labor uh, and their economic opportunity. Uh, now, having said that, what's the best mechanism? I think we should tackle some of the challenges you brought out, which is the uh, high cost of education, uh, more head-on, before we say the educational system uh, is itself irrelevant. Uh, maybe if we said, let's figure out a way for it to be more accessible. And then also recognize that just going to college and um, graduating uh, is good enough uh, to be ensuring yourself of all of your future economic opportunity, I think is just not going to be true anymore. I think you have to go reskill. Uh, so these apprenticeship programs, in-job training programs, for example, at Microsoft, when I look at all of what we are trying to do, even for engineers, um, when something, a new technology like AI comes in, we are doing AI schools. Uh, you have to, in some sense, hit the books again in a massive way, uh, but in an applied sense. Um, and so those are, I think, what is the responsibility of individuals but they need assistance of tools and networks. Uh, definitely LinkedIn is one of them. But also businesses and business leaders who are willing to invest uh, in the training of their people. Uh, so I think that's at least what I would say uh, is what needs to happen. And we see. I mean, the MOOCs definitely have a role to play. You know, I sign up for more MOOCs than I finish. Uh, but uh, it's, it's the fact that you can accept, you know, access them is just fantastic. Down here, number one, yeah. Due to just how many companies are seizing the opportunity of the digital revolution, would you say that the next Microsoft or Apple is a realistic possibility in, in the near future? You know, every time anyone has sort of said um, the success that anyone has had uh, can't be surpassed, all you have to do is wait a little and they have been surpassed. Um, so I do believe uh, that innovation will come, companies will get built, success uh, will happen. But it may not happen even narrowly like we think of it today as what is high tech. One of the most fascinating things that I'm observing uh, as part of what I see around the world is every company I work with, whether it's Rolls Royce or whether it is uh, BMW uh, or anyone, they're digital companies today. In other words, they have to, in fact, build their own software capability to produce these smart things, the smart cities, the smart financial products. So I don't think it's no going to be the case that there's going to be a high-tech industry or a digital industry and then the rest. 
I think we're all, like electricity, uh, I think we're all going to have uh, the ability to use this new essential factor of production in very innovative ways. And if anything, one of the things I write about in the book is the need of the R, both in terms of entrepreneurial energy and return, quite frankly, is that some of the harder challenges, like climate change, um, or any of the other, you know, food production even, are being solved uh, by uh, entrepreneurs who get the backing of uh, risk capital, uh, and then obviously the return so that there's more investment in sectors of the economy uh, that go very beyond uh, even a narrow, let's say, consumer-led internet. Yep, number three. Um, I'd like to return to the cricket theme, if possible. Um, do you think that the drift to um, 2020 cricket away from test cricket is symptomatic of a generational shift to instant grat gratification, maybe at the expense of depth and substance? <laughs> you know, let me say I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, go to the Lords tomorrow, which is the, the very first time I've ever stepped in there. Uh, I, I admire and I love watching Test cricket. Unfortunately, I don't have the time for it. Uh, but luckily enough, because of at least streaming media, you can watch it uh, in small chunks all over. Um, and I, but to me, that's the only form of cricket that I enjoy. You, you, you talk in your book about this need for this big thought process around AI. But picking up on the gentleman's point, no, no one's going to bother about that. They'll want whatever it is as quickly as possible. And you, you will need to give it to them. You're not going to be able to sit around there, you know, Socrates-like, you know, <laughs> thinking about, well, where are things going? Because your competitors are going to be out there moving fast, and, moving fast and breaking things. It's a great Hasn't point. Hasn't that always been technology's way? It's a great point. But here, let me, let me just sort of argue a couple of things, which is... Um, this is, I guess, somebody was saying there's a debate uh, between uh, the 1984 and the Brave New World, and that's a fantastic debate to uh, be had, because in some sense, what's, what's probably as much of a challenge is the Brave New World. Um, and that is our own ability uh, to amuse ourselves to death uh, is a challenge if it's not checked. I'll give you where I get my inspiration for this, Minecraft. When I watch the Minecraft generation, they are not just playing a game. They are taking what is their imagination and bringing it to life. Uh, in fact, one of the interesting data points is if you introduce Minecraft in education, it equalizes even on the gender side the approach to STEM. In fact, it brings more girls because they're not, again, bound to some particular curriculum of computer science that may even have a bias. Uh, so I think the more creation tools we put in place, uh, people will choose for even this instant gratification by doing things that are much more digital but artisanal. Like one of the other fascinating things I've been watching is Paint, Microsoft Paint, is used by 100 million people every month. You know, I was like, wow, that's pretty stunning. So we said, what are they doing? In fact, <laughs> they, they're doodling, they're painting. In fact, we have this other property called Mixer where people watch game streaming. But it's not just game streaming. They're watching people code. They're watching people paint. And so we then said, let's take inspiration from that and build even this 3D paint. Um, and so now in Windows, we have 3D paint, so that that's in fact the atomic particle for this virtual reality or mixed reality world, mm -hmm. because after all, if you're gonna have holograms, you need artists of the new form who create these artifacts. So I think we've got to start redefining even how people get satisfaction, what is entertainment, uh, what is the creation versus consumption. The equation sometimes is, uh, let me get quick consumption hits. That, I think, is not the be-all, end-all uh, of what satisfies us deeply as humans. Yeah, number, uh, number one. And then we'll come uh, into this block here. There's a gentleman there with a tie. A question about you. What, if anything, did you learn from your Marxist father? <laughs> <clears throat> I would say um, 
the one thing that I did learn was, I mean, think about what an audacious guy Marx was um, in having the intellectual ambition to essentially put a formula to history. And uh, my father definitely had that. Uh, he was a person who, uh, he is a person who loves ideas and pushes new ideas. Um, and he instilled that love for ideas in me. But if I think about even some of the issues we talked about uh, around equity or the ra rise of inequity, we do need uh, in our social democracies or our capitalist societies deal with some of the dystopian views that Marx had of late stage capitalism. Um, I think rereading that is not a bad idea uh, because I think capitalism, only stable ground we have is if there is increasing levels uh, of equity for more people. Um, you know, one of the things about America that also is stunning to me is I believe, and there may be bigger experts here, never in human history uh, have more people been able to live in an egalitarian society like the United States, which I think is one of those other precious things. You know, uh, people talk about the blue-collar aristocracy. Uh, Angus Deacon even has, you know, written about it. Uh, it's stunning. I mean, you know, how many people who are blue-collar workers would have made something like $50,000, $60,000, which is what uh, a lot of what uh, was the wage support that they got in the U.S.? Uh, to me, those are magical things uh, that have happened in capitalism, and we have to somehow figure out how that can be broad spread. So at least, you know, I, 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 I'm definitely a capitalist. <laughs> I, I, I run Microsoft. Uh, but uh, my father's Marxist leanings at least get me to think about uh, what are the virtues of capitalism that we need to make sure we preserve and not, uh, you know, be blinded by. There aren't that many books by chief executives that quote Terry Eagleton, who is a famous <laughs> Marxist cultural commentator, but it's in his book. Uh, number one, yeah, this gentleman... Uh, yeah, that's great. The gentleman here and then the lady in the blue top there, yeah, great. Um, what's your next project, big killer project, for example... You had Office and Windows. What's your next big killer project? Well, you're among friends here, Satya, so you can tell us <laughs> your next big launch. You know, the, the thing that we are uh, very excited about are th developments in three areas. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to talk about my product launch. Uh, <laughs> but you're all about sharing, Satya. That's this right. is the new... Come on, we can test it. There are limits to everything. <laughs> <laughs> like, here's the thing. Um, I'm very, very excited uh, about uh, mixed reality. I think uh, we briefly touched on it, but this notion that what is your field of view uh, is a computing experience is, I think, a real departure. Um, it's the ultimate computing experience in some sense. We call it mixed reality because we think of virtual reality where you're fully immersed and augmented reality as just a dial setting uh, versus two different platforms, so we're building devices, we're building cloud services for it. We're well on our way uh, uh, on that piece, but a lot to come. The, we talked plenty about AI uh, and what it can do. Um, you know, one of the projects that I'm most excited about is Cortana, in particular as a digital assistant. Uh, I send mails and I'll say, I'll follow up with you tomorrow. Uh, it wakes up tomorrow and tells me, have you done that? And it helps me, you know, saves my day all the time. Uh, you know, one of the other magical things that has happened uh, for us is uh, machine trans... I mean, just basically language translation. You can be doing a PowerPoint presentation and simultaneously translate it into 60-plus languages, uh, and people can follow along. I mean, the language barrier uh, and all of the things that happen in communications. But the thing that we talked about even earlier this week for the first time more publicly, uh, it's a little ways out there, is our quantum uh, work. You know, for all this talk of uh, great progress we've made, uh, I'd like to, you know, the first supercomputers had something like 13,000 transistors. The Xbox One X that's going to come out in October is going to have 7 billion transistors. Uh, so obviously we have a lot of capacity. Yet, let's talk about all the computational problems that are not solved. 
Uh, we can't even model an enzyme in natural food production. We don't have that catalyst that can absorb uh, the carbon in the air. Uh, we can't design the new material that will be superconducting in high temperature for lossless power transmission. These are all computational problems. And if you try to solve it uh, using a classical computer, it will take as much time as it there has been between Big Bang to now. So we need a new approach. Uh, and interestingly enough, quantum mechanics does give us at least a theory. And we are well on, way, well on our way to bring the math, the physics, um, and the computer science, because all the computer science, at least I learned, uh, is just redundant for a quantum computer. Uh, and so we've got to put a complete new system together. So these are all ambitious projects uh, that we are excited about, and, and we'll keep talking about it in the years to come. Great, exactly. Yeah, question here, number one, and then the lady at the back, just at the back of this block. Thanks, yeah. Hi there, thank you. Um, it's been really inspirational and encouraging to hear some of the things you've been talking about, particularly as a fellow CEO um, working in a different sector. So I lead a company in financial services trying to rebuild trust in the financial sector, but really through working out how we can work with technology and, in, and, and education to bring financial security to the masses. Um, and I think there are so many parallels I draw from the things you've talked about, but I don't see technology companies like yourselves embracing this challenge, working with us in the financial services to try and bring this kind of change around these kinds of inequalities, around basic financial education and security. So I'd love your thoughts on that. I mean, I think you, the, the first thing that you talked about is an issue that, in fact, I write a, a, a bit about, uh, which is trust. Uh, and how are we, as a technology company, going to earn the trust uh, of users of digital technology? And that's a very multi-constituent piece. Uh, and that's where I think we have to do some of the best work ourselves as technology providers. Uh, but also, we need a policy framework that allows us to do that. But to your very specific question, this is the place where, at least in our context at Microsoft, our entire business model and our entire focus is how can we take digital technology and apply it in healthcare, in financial services, in any other sector of the economy, so that they can drive the dividends to all of their constituents, right? That, to me, I mean, when I think about the cloud and what it can mean, uh, it's an ingredient in, for you to be able to reduce your transactional costs. I mean, I look at even all of the blockchain applications that are being written, it's all fundamentally so that the transactional costs can come down and there can be more trust, uh, and then whatever surplus gets created gets actually split uh, and, you know, across all the constituents. So my job, at least as I think of it, is to really bring that force of commoditization to industry after industry. Uh, and we would definitely love to partner up, and we are, in fact, uh, even right here in the UK, uh, whether it's in financial services or others. And we do that not only through technology, but we have a massive um, you know, uh, social responsibility and philanthropy piece to it as well, uh, and working with the governments uh, in partnership. So it'll be something we should follow up. You can swap cards. There's a lady just at the back there at this block, and then we'll come to that end, and then that's that side there. Yeah. yeah. Good evening, Satya. Uh, I'm really enjoying this interview. You've helped settle a long-standing disagreement between my husband and I because he said nonviolent communication will never go mainstream. And you mentioning it in some of your interviews has made it go up into the Amazon bestseller list, so thank you. I'm wondering, uh, when I hear words like empathy and vulnerability in business, I'm really excited, but I'm wondering if you had any pushback and what's your, um, anything you have to say about NVC in business? I mean, again, um I was introduced, in fact, one of the things that I've realized as part of writing this book and definitely doing uh, these talks is uh, the real uh, reader in the house is my wife. And uh, you know, she's the one who introduced me to Carol Dweck, and she's the one who really introduced me to even uh, NBC. Um, I have not tried to approach anything inside Microsoft as some new dogma that I am trying to propagate. Uh, if anything, uh, even the growth mindset, I, I, you know, I, it, that's one of the reasons why I, I'm afraid of it, quite frankly, because I think the one way for cultural 
change uh, to get stymied is when it's viewed as, okay, it's sort of one person's agenda uh, versus I want to do this because it helps me. And the reason why, if there is any success of this growth mindset uh, or even NVC uh, inside the company is because people are drawing upon it because it gives them or it, it, it inspires them, and they can be a better partner, a better parent, a better colleague, a better leader, and in fact harmonizes what is their life and work. Uh, that, I think, is the power of these uh, techniques or books or mindsets, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, at least that's my point of view. So Have I, you had pushback? And pushback. Within the business. And, 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 and I, as I said, like, I'm not even sort of saying, let me push it on you. Uh, so to some degree, take it if it appeals to you. If it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, at least that's what we are trying to do, which is uh, let's give it a lot of breathing space. The other thing I've realized is most people interpret things differently. Uh, it's because we're all shaped by our life's experiences. We're all in different stages of life's experiences. I, mean, I myself was very different, as my book proves, uh, at 25 versus 50. Uh, and how I would have reacted to someone telling me about NVC at 25 would have been pretty different than I'm sure it is now, uh, as, yeah. again, uh, you know, it's true. And so that's how I would approach it. Uh, number three there. Yeah. Yeah. Hi there. Um, thank you for an excellent talk. I, I wanted to ask on fintech. It's obviously a large part of the digital revolution. Um, we're seeing big companies enter the space, you know, Apple and Google already entering the payment space. What are Microsoft planning and what are your visions or views around how fintech can impact and, and help the world? Um, it's a, related to even, I think, a little bit of a previous question, but overall, we are very, very clear about the, what role we want to play in the various industry, whether it's fintech or even health tech or uh, any of the new areas where essentially there are digital products in these different sectors. We want to be a platform. Uh, we do not want to directly participate in these markets, uh, but we want to work with startups, we want to work with established players, uh, and take whatever the AI component, the cloud component, the device components, and commoditize them. Uh, that, to me, is how we construct our business model, because I think, going back to trust, what is going to be a real currency for digital companies like ours is going to be trust in business model, more so than anything else. If you say one day that, you know, yeah, you should use my cloud, but yeah, you know, by the way, I have a car company and I have a, a drug company and a fintech company on the side, no fintech company, no drug company, no car company is going to work with you. Uh, so you've got to be very principled about what businesses you're in, how the business model stability uh, because we are cogs now. Uh, we're not just an office system. You're really built into the cost of goods of the product. Um, and so as a supplier, you need to make sure that you have real stability of business model. And that's at least what I'm focused on. Number two. There's quite a few around there. So, yeah. Yes. Um, how do you think your upbringing in India has influenced and shaped your views and empathy in running Microsoft? Um, you know, I, I'm a product of, uh, you know, having grown up in India and then essentially all my uh, higher education and professional experience is all American. So I don't know how to delineate uh, the two and the blend between the two. Quite frankly, it's one of the things that I even try to say, well, what, what's uh, American about me or what is Indian about me? Uh, I am obviously uh, uh, an American of Indian uh, origin. Uh, but if anything, I think... Um, it's my parents and uh, their views, and in particular, my mother, as I now uh, recognize it, uh, the way uh, she instilled in me, perhaps, that calmness, right, which is, you know, I sometimes think it's so important for us to be able to do our very best given an opportunity in the moment. Uh, as someone described this to me, you can't wait for your next job to do your best work. Um, and a little bit of that, I think, is my mom's influence, which in, a, in an interesting way, all of what, my, say, my dad gave me in terms of intellectual curiosity was helpful. But what I think my mom taught me uh, is perhaps the more enduring lesson, 
that I find uh, has uh, definitely shaped who I am. Excellent. Number two, yep. Yes. So it's fascinating to hear you talk about your mother, a Sanskrit professor. Your name, Satya, in Sanskrit is truth or truthfulness. A problem that a lot of leaders, CEOs, say they, they suffer from is the further up the food chain you get, the less truth you hear. How do you approach that problem in Microsoft? No one's honest to you, yeah. <laughs> this lady down here, yeah. Um, it is, I mean, I think all uh, structures and how information flows in structures is one of the harder challenges. Uh, but quite frankly, one of the things we have gone to work, and this is an area where we have a lot to do because of the tools we create and the systems we create. Um, one of the ways I uh, at least uh, like to push to keep in touch, every morning I get up and the first thing I see uh, is the email notification on, from Yammer, which is where we have the water cooler conversation at Microsoft. All the 100,000 people are buzzing about whatever is top of mind. Uh, and we have, uh, and they ask me all the questions uh, they need to, or they're, you know, they're talking about their uh, issue of the day, and I got to be in touch with it. So that's, it's an amazing tool for me to be in touch with what people are thinking, as opposed to walking into office not knowing uh, what's top of mind. But it doesn't end there. One of the other things that we do a lot of is these town hall uh, type of meetings, and we use our technology there. One of the most intimidating things is while I am talking, um, first of all, we broadcast it over Skype and it's translated into any language and people are able to react to it with emojis. Um, <laughs> and uh, luckily enough, I don't see it in real time because it's behind me. Uh, but one of the things that we do is we analyze all of the emojis after. Uh, and they're all anonymous, so therefore if there's lots of thumbs down on whatever I said, that's <laughs> signal. Uh, that's one way information flows. Uh, so we use a lot of our technology to some degree to keep that flow of information and be in touch. And as you said, uh, the real currency perhaps nowadays is uh, how does you know, truth prevail? Uh, and whether it's about how you lead organizations or in our society or anywhere. Um, and I think it's an important issue. Digital tools can help. There are also unintended consequences. As we know, we've got to tackle them all. Lady here. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask um, a question as a parent, and you mentioned your mother and father. What advice can we give youngsters about the digital world and the benefits it brings, but also some of the very negative uh, connotations and things that happen online for young people? Um, you know, I, I mean, I'll give you the very practical uh, work that at least uh, uh, anu and I are doing with our children as they're growing up um, and uh, it's to one have real dialogue uh, around both the power of the technology and the empowerment uh, but as well as all of the challenges of it um, in fact their own responsibility for example you know let's take cyber security one of the things that I think is so important for everyone to know, whether you're a senior citizen or a young child, uh, is your responsibility to protect yourself. Uh, we, as technology providers, clearly are the first responders, and we have a tremendous amount to do. But there is also such a thing as uh, being educated on what it means to secure yourself. It's like crossing the road. Uh, how do you teach a child on how to, you know, uh, you know, uh, do that safely. I think a little bit of that and spending the time talking through it is very helpful. Then the same thing, you know, in my house at least, there's always a negotiation that happens all the time on screen time. Um, and uh, luckily enough, there are tools. Uh, we use, I mean, I you know, obviously use Microsoft account and you know, we, have, we have transparency. I mean, I see what they're seeing. Uh, they know that. Um, and uh, that's a great way of at least us uh, being able to have... Uh, What's your view on screen time, Satya? What What's that? your view on screen time? Do you have cut-off moments? Uh, uh, yes, uh, we do. In our case, at least, uh, it is at least an hour or so before going to bed uh, is when uh, we cut off uh, screen time. Um, and then also, I think it's what do you do with the time you have on the screen uh, is also the next level. Mm. Um, because I think it's easy to get distracted. Uh, one of the other things, even forget my children, 
I, I need those tools and I use those tools. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's easy to sort of be undisciplined uh, by just either being on the email threads, uh, but you need to do real work, which might require either thinking or writing. Uh, these are, I think, important skills, even in the digital world, even if you're writing digitally. Uh, so have, and, and one of the things that we do is uh, we track how you're spending your time. This is analytics for you. It's not about, it's like you know, going to the gym and having data on uh, whether you exercised or not. Uh, time, if it's your scarce commodity, uh, we should treat it uh, like your health. Yeah, yeah at the back. Um, oh. yep. Hi. Thank Hi. you for sharing the story about your son. I found it um, very moving. I, my husband and I just have had a uh, new baby and I've returned back to work. So you obviously have commitments at home and have commitments to Microsoft. And I wondered if you had any tips on balancing and, and how you manage both. Um, I don't know if I have... Um, uh, any sort of tips, except for what I've at least tried to do, uh, because it's such a hard thing. I mean, this work-life balance, as uh, some folks would sort of describe it, uh, is just a real challenge, and I've struggled with it. Uh, uh, both my wife and I, uh, in fact, in some sense, it, it was because of our son's condition, my wife had to even make the hard trade-off of not going back into the workforce. Um, the one thing that I, I think of now is more the harmony versus the balance, because it's impossible for me to say this is an equation that somehow has to be balanced in all time. Uh, so I'm at least trying to develop in me more discipline on in the moments I'm there, am I really there? And this again is a bit of a screen time type of question. There's lots of times I'm there and yet I'm on my phone or I'm on my computer. Uh, and that's, you know, you're physically there, but you're really not. Um, and so to me, being disciplined about doing those few things uh, with your children um, uh, or with, with, with my wife uh, that are more meditative in the sense that you're in the moment, I think are super important. And it requires a lot of discipline and uh, it's very hard at least, but that's at least what I'm pushing myself to do. Okay, we're just about up to time. So the last two questions we'll take together. If there's a, a gentleman or a woman up there. There was a woman, actually, but are you gonna, you're going to nick it, are you? Okay, that's a good work-life balance there. Okay, fine. Yeah. Oh, hopefully it's a bit clearer. Yeah. Yeah. Are you speaking <laughs> for your, the person next to you? Or? Yeah. Good. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. The, the question is um, coming back to AI, and you've mentioned about cybersecurity as well. Um, you know, Talking about the control problem where we have uh, super intelligent AI that uh, might be released, um, how confident are you in, in terms of cybersecurity when you know, cybersecurity nowadays is 99.9% you know, .9 is a good metric of um, screening for, for threats? So how, how, how confident are you in developing that when in the future 99% you know, might not be good enough? Yeah, I mean, one last question here, then that'll be it. Yeah, one last question. Yep. Very quick one. Thank you for your talk. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, whoever. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So, how do you think about China and uh, what's happening there? Because obviously, the focus has been the Silicon Valley, but a lot of work is going on in China for uh, in terms of technology and development. And do you have any thoughts? Is it is it a threat? It's an opportunity. And how do you deal with China? That's a great question. So let me just take yeah. the things quickly. Um, the control problem clearly is a, one of the big challenges um, as AGI happens. And my only point is let us not abdicate our ability to control the control problem, if that makes any sense. In other words, uh, there is a lot of research that needs to be done today on the control problem. What are, for example, these runaway optimization challenges? That's why I kind of talk about what, how do you make computers uh, or these algorithms intelligible um, and test them. What is the test harness uh, for an agent that is independent? Uh, you know, can you use some mechanism like these adversarial networks uh, to in fact test uh, even uh, the, the agent? So I think that there's a lot uh, of research. There are a lot of people at Microsoft and elsewhere, and this is another place where the partnership of AI uh, should be very helpful. Let's even take techniques we develop around this, 
like good tooling we had in computer science or in security, like threat modeling, put it into the public domain so that we can, in fact, all get better. Uh, so that's how I view that. China, op, you know, one, one of the things we talked a lot about is mostly uh, Silicon Valley companies and, uh, and so on, but you know, you're clearly uh, what uh, the Chinese companies are doing in technology, and in fact, I would say across industries is pretty phenomenal. Um, and I think the dialogue between the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, the rest of the European Union, uh, and China is all going to be important. We can't think of this as let's the Western countries talk and figure this out, and China is going to be something that we'll deal with later. Uh, if anything, even take AI development. Uh, whatever I just said about the control problem around AI, if people from China the, have to be full participants in that dialogue. Uh, and that'll at least be my, what I will advocate every opportunity I get, and that's what my hope would be that we achieve. Satya, thank you so much. Time is sadly against us. Um, 90 minutes of fascinating thoughts from you. Thank you to you, the audience, for some fantastic questions. Uh, thank you to Intelligence Squared. But in the main, uh, thank you to Satya. His book is on sale in the foyer. I recommend you go and buy it. <laughs>